All right. Hey, everyone. Welcome to the show. I'm here with James Lavish. James, welcome back to the show. I enjoyed our last chat with Greg and, and the others. It was a blast. And I'm excited to, to just go one on one here with you. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited to be here. Thank you for having me back. That was awesome. Uh, it was super fun. So uh, thank we, you for having me, Preston. Oh, yeah, my pleasure. So when we were when we were talking with Greg, we covered this a little bit, which was the Japan piece. And this story just seems to kind of get more interesting by the day, right? It kind of exploded onto the onto my radar, you know. And when you asked that question uh, in that in the first interview or our first podcast, yeah, you said what 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 are you looking at? Like what charts are you looking at? And I said I'm I'm really watching the yen because this is kind of this is wild what they're doing. It is, and wild. you know, um, it's not anything different than they've been doing all along. However, they've diverged from what the Fed is doing so severely now that it has just been like everybody, you start, you're starting to hear people talk about it a lot. You know, Luke is talking about it, Lynn is talking about it, you're, you're talking about it, Greg and I are talking about it. It's just, it's something that it's like a, you're watching this slow motion train wreck and you, there's nothing you can really do except just watch these guys um, continue this. So for your, I mean, for the benefit of your your audience, what, what's going on is that the Bank of Japan has instituted a policy that just like we, we've been doing all the way up until this point of quantitative easing, they have said that they're going to keep the 10-year uh, JGBs at 0.25%. And they're going to buy every single bond that is offered to keep it at 0.25%. And, uh, and as you know, as we've talked about before, that, that puts a tremendous pressure, amount of pressure on their currency. Because if you have investors, other sovereigns who are selling the yen or selling these JGBs, and then they get yen for those, they're going to sell that yen out because they don't want to be holding yen. And of course, the yen just, it, it's skyrocketed against the dollar, meaning it, it, it's a reverse quote in in the market so when it goes from 120 to 130 to one it's headed to 140 that's a major negative move in the yen so uh, this is the release valve you know that there's pressure building up and the currency is the release valve and it's wild how they're just standing there just swallowing all this debt it was it was last i think it was last week will clementi shoots me a text message and it's just the picture of the of the JGB uh, ten year, and it had exploded up to exploded twenty basis points uh, up to 046 percent, which yeah. you know if, if you're if you're trying to peg it at 0.25 and it and it blows up there to you know, it sells out to 0.45 or 0.46 or whatever mm-hmm. it was. Um, that's a really big deal. And so I pulled up the chart, and I mean. The, every duration in, mm. on the yield curve, the 30 year down to the, the one, I think the no, three year, we're all blowing out yeah. and, so like on the you, chart. Yeah. Yeah. So what th- that's, that's during our market hours, right? So that's yeah. when their window, their windows closed. Yeah. So what you're seeing is that's the swap market. So that's the institutional traders, the hedge funds who are shorting the Japanese bonds because they're they're expecting that the Bank of Japan is going to have to back away. They can't just keep doing this forever. So they're shorting the bonds and buying the yen against them in that trade. So that's kind of where it gives you, it's a little bit scary. And that, that's why I'm watching this every single day and to see what happens outside the trading window, uh, outside the, the Bank of Japan's, their, their uh, open market window. And so it gives you an idea how quickly it, this thing will move. And with they just, if they stepped away and let them trade freely, uh, this is going to a half a percent without even blinking. It's crazy. Um, so I, so since then you're seeing this happen every day when they're, exactly. when their market is closing. And so I pulled up the chart and I put it in hourly terms. So you can see basically when it's blowing out, when it's not open. And then when they're opening and they're they're buying yeah. to try to peg They're the yield. Yeah. It's crazy. I mean, it looks like there was a person that that wrote in the comments on the chart that I posted, uh, something like, hey, this this looks exactly like when something mechanically is getting ready to have a, a s- systematic failure. 
Right. Um, right. <laughs> and and it like, kind of looks exactly like yeah, what it is. Yeah. It looks like uh, maybe like um, uh, the, the tremors before yeah. a ma- like a, like when you um, uh, what are they, what are the tremors called in before an earthquake? Um, they're uh, they're four shocks, right? Yeah. So they're kind of like yeah. the four shocks of, of this, uh, of, of this currency that's about to collapse. And it's not funny, actually. It's not, it's terrible. And, um, yeah, no, I, I actually, I'm actually, I'm actually, uh, I'm actually a little bit worried. I like, I like Japan. Um, you know, I've got Japanese friends. It, it's, it's not a good thing. And, but, but James, this is the, this is the thing for me is, uh, there was a book called, uh, the Holy grail of, of economics, uh, written by Dr. Ku. Okay. And I remember reading this book and it, it, it outlines the whole Japanese, uh, you know, QE extravaganza. And it goes through like why it happened, how, how was a balance sheet recession and all this all stuff. the economics and all that. Yes. Yeah. And it was, it was a really interesting read, but when I was done with it and I got to the end, I was like, nowhere in here does it talk about how any of this gets resolved or solved. Nowhere. It doesn't. It doesn't. It doesn't. It doesn't. And that's a crazy thing. So if you look at it now, I, okay. So for the people who are listening, the, the, the Japanese yen will that, that spread between the U S 10 year treasury and the Japanese 10 year treasury, as that widens, the yen follows that spread. So you can see, you can plot it against it and you could see how the yen just follows it. And so the problem is that we're, we're not, we're not loosening anytime soon. We're tightening, we're tightening it. We, we're hell bent on tightening into this recession, right? So that's what we're, that's where we're going and our rates are going higher. So Japan has now taken in what? $80 billion worth of US dollars worth of yen last week. So they're on track to do, to, to buy over $300 billion U.S. dollars worth of Japanese government bonds this month in June, and you know there there's a um, there's a, a a metric that they, that nobody's no sovereign has ever crossed, right? No central bank has ever crossed, and that's owning fifty percent of your own debt, and mm. they're they're mm. they're bumping up against it. So they're already at over to like 228, 230% of, of debt to GDP. Mm -hmm. I mean, mathematically, the answer is there's no solution. I mean, it's just the the debt has to blow up, has to blow up. So if this blows, so let's pull the thread. So if this starts to blow up and it's becomes unmanageable now, the central bankers collectively Right. This isn't just Japan. This is all of them have to step into this with easing. W- would you agree with that? Well, I mean, there's absolutely there's going to be contagion. You know, I mean, yeah. Uh, I, I think I, I tried to burn through some of your questions um, that people posted underneath. Uh, thank you for posting the questions today. Um, and somebody said, "Well, well, you know, what happens to the end?" So you just asked, like, "What's the resolution?" Well, the resolution, yeah. as you know, is people lose confidence, sovereigns lose confidence, investors lose confidence, they stop buying the Japanese bonds, the bond market locks up, Japanese you know, government has to just continue buying them or back away, whatever, whatever happens. And the confidence in the yen just collapses, the yen hyperinflates, right? And what does that do? It's what you just said, there's going to be contagion to other sovereigns, and to uh, you know, major major banks that have exposure to this, it's just it just it's the kind of thing that'll have ripples across the world. So, um, one of the things that you and I have talked about, and we're we're watching pretty closely. I know you are watching too. Is Europe? I mean, now we have this thing where Lagarde comes out and says that, well, we have this new tool, right? The the um, it's called the anti fragmentation tool. Right. And so they're watching the Italian bonds, their Italian 10 years blow up over 4% yield. And so they have an emergency meeting. They're like, okay, well, so we'll only do QE in Italy. And then everybody else, you're on your own, but we're doing QE in Italy. Oh, and maybe Greece. 
And if Spain and Portugal pop up, maybe we'll have to do it there too. But Germany, they're, they're in such will, a debacle Germany because they've got basically. all the different, they got all the different countries that are in different debt loads. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's nuts. Yeah. It's like, it's like, um, I mean, you're, <laughs> your, your kids have yeah yeah that's a great way to put they're it. living in your basement mm-hmm. you know they're 38 42 years old they run up this massive debt some of them are a little bit more responsible than the others but not really not by a not lot really <laughs> I'm not really but then yeah. you've got these north you've got the northern countries you've got the responsible parties mm-hmm. who are going to have to take care of them you know yeah. and I, that does that's a recipe again for disaster you yeah. know so yeah. um it's uh yeah it's it's going to be interesting <laughs> to to say the least it's going to be interesting and it, and it's you know i'm sitting here laughing it's kind of a nervous laugh it's not it's it's super serious i've never seen i've never seen anything like this you know people are asking like well is this is this like 1970 is it like 1940 is is, is it like the great financial crisis like nope yeah. Nope. I don't think it's like any of them. I know that it's a little bit more like 1940 because of the, you know, yeah. the kind of lockdown from the world war and the supply chain issues and inflation. But this is, this is something we've never seen. It's we've never be- had it's a debt to GDP like this. Yeah. You've never had yeah. an M2 supply money supply go straight through the roof. Right. Well, I don't think you've ever, I don't think you've ever had nations able to kick the can down the road and avoid uh, avoid economic reality for as long as this this long term cycle has gone, and I think a little bit of that has to do just with with the uh, with the knowledge that's kind of popped out of the last eighty years, and the connectivity, and and the uh, the internet, and the sharing of information has allowed the the globe to. Uh, twist the dials to such perfection to keep this thing quote unquote stable for as long as they have. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. And it, and they're, and they've been kicking this can down the road and they are all doing it in concert. Right. Yeah. And that's oh, the thing connected. is that they're yeah. all doing it together, you yeah. know? And I loved your, uh, your, your analogy, but with, with um when you were on what bitcoin did with peter and mm-hmm. your analogy with the the monopoly boards and and they're the central bankers from each board are like all right you gonna so are you <laughs> yeah, what are you doing coordinate like, yeah okay yeah and it's they have to because if they don't the the it's going to be mutiny mutiny exactly which it will yeah. eventually be anyways, right? Because of the separation yeah. of wealth. When I was in college, we, we studied this as like a, and I couldn't relate to it. You know, this is, I mean, I'm going to date myself here, but back in 1990, 1993, <laughs> and, um, and we were studying uh, the, 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 the separation of wealth in Latin American countries. Mm-hmm. And I couldn't really relate to it. I was like, mm-hmm. ah, but you know, it, they're, they, they made so many mistakes. They should, they should have retained a middle class or built up a middle class. And literally at that time, we're destroying our middle class. And so from, from then to now, now that we have virtually no middle class, right? We're just gutting it, um, that we're ending up in the same position. Yeah. We're ending up in it, it you know, so... I wrote a thread a long time ago about uh, why, why you should have Bitcoin as a uh, right to Bitcoin, right? <laughs> why, yeah. why you should have a Bitcoin, why you should have Bitcoin as a, as a hedge against hyperinflation. I had some P- I had people come on that thread, you know, and kind of laugh it off and say, it never happened in the United States, no way. And well, I, I do believe that the United States would be the last for it to happen to you. I, that's my belief. Yeah. Um, we're, we're, we're super fortunate that we're kind of in that position, I believe. I don't know, but I believe that. But if you think it can't happen here, you're, you're kidding yourself. Yes. It can absolutely happen here. Yeah. And it can happen faster than you, than you realize. And do I think it will? No, I don't think it'll happen. Not anytime soon. Um, I hope that we have an, I, I have this hope and this vision of a, an orderly operating system 
getting put in place and 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 being used and and working in coordination uh as a you know like a bit like bitcoin as a reserve asset and then for us to kind of switch over but if if we have things like they're happening in japan and in europe and you get complete meltdowns all bets are off the table every it's, single bet is off the table people <clears throat> people in the digital asset space this past two three weeks have got a taste of how fast contagion and counterparty risk can blow up. Uh, they've seen this. They've seen the Celsius thing. You saw BlockFi needed and uh, somebody to give them some some liquidity, um, and you saw people who had deposits that got totally locked. And yeah. it, it happened literally at the snap of a finger that all of this kind of came unraveling. And I I think the the catalyst was really Luna. It blew up. Then everybody's like. You're seeing who's swimming naked, and then all of a sudden Celsius locks up their clients, and then 3AC does. And so it, it just all, I think if people look back and be like, well, I just didn't even, it, it happened so fast, I think is yeah. what the common person. Risk, risk happens fast. fast. Greg, Greg, <laughs> Greg Foss's favorite quote. And, right. you know, um, and, and I was watching the Luna thing happen, and I thought at the time, naively, I thought, well, it's kind of contained, you know? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and, you know, looking back on it, like you just said, everything happened so quickly. It, it's just like 1998 with long-term capital management, you yeah. know? And yeah. um, I was sitting there on the desk and I get this call from uh, from another trader at a hedge fund. Uh, at the time I was, I was trading risk arbitrage, trading merger arbitrage, helping manage this book of, you know, of, of tons of positions of, of merger arbitrage. <clears throat> And for your for your uh, listeners, merger arbitrage is where you where you um, you buy the stock of of a company that's going to get bought out, whether it's for cash or stock or a combination of cash and stock. That can, it can get super complicated, but you buy the stock that's of the company that's getting bought out, and you short the the stock of the company that's buying them in the right ratio, and you annualize that return, and you can you can capture the spread. For the only risk is that the deal falls apart. Mm -hmm. Right. That's mm -hmm. the, that's the risk. The deal falls apart. Mm -hmm. You don't care where the market goes. The market could go up or down. You you've, you're kind of hedged out of beta unless somehow the market movement impacts the likelihood of the deal closing, which is unlikely unless the deal is subject to financing. And if see, the deal is subject to financing and the market falls apart, then, you know, you could have issues, but pause. Pause, because I got to ask you a, a burning question I've got right now, yeah. and we're coming back to your point here. I'm not going to disrupt yeah. your point. Is is the Elon Musk deal going to go through? Now that oh, you just man. said that, <laughs> I, the whole time know, I'm just like, is that going to happen? What, what's, I've got to dig into it. Yes but the market's no. telling the market's telling you no, or okay. that it's at least right, going to get it, it's it's going to get repriced. That's okay. what. Go back to right? so, sorry. So, keep going. <laughs> okay, so so you know, so I'm trading. The, yeah. the merger arbitrage. And so we, you're, you're studying the likelihood of the deal closing. It's all you care about. You don't care where the market goes. Yeah. You, you usually avoid the deals that have, that have uh, financing risk because you don't want to have market risk, right? So anyway, so we have this book of, of, of deals. I mean, we're in 1998, I want to say, Preston, we're probably, we probably have a half a billion dollar book at that point. Mm -hmm. Okay, of, of merger deals in this mm -hmm. in this uh, in this hedge fund. Get this call, and it's a trader at another firm, and he asked, "Hey, do you guys have any exposure to um, to Goldman Sachs?" And I was like, "No, why? <laughs> Who's asking like, and why?" <laughs> he's yeah. like, "He's like, uh, you've heard what's going on with long term capital management." I said, "Yeah, of course. We were all watching the spreads yeah. kind of creep out." Anyway, so what had happened is long term capital management, this hedge fund that's run by, um, by Nobel Prize winning uh, mathematicians who have created the Black-Scholes theory, uh, Black-Scholes um, um, calculation for the, for the risk of, of options trading, right? So, <clears throat> and so these guys are really smart. I mean, super too smart, smart right? too smart, yeah. Too smart for their own good. So what they did is they took a billion dollars, they levered it up and borrowed doing swaps and with every single uh, prime broker and, and, and counterparty they could find. 
they levered this, this book up to over $100 billion. So they're like 100 to 1 levered. And what they're doing is they're, they're basically short volatility because they're, they're playing interest rate arbitrage, mm-hmm. which is one of the big things they were doing. And they're, they're, there's a lot of stuff they were doing. That was one of the biggest things they were doing. And a lot of merger arbitrage a ton of merger arbitrage, Hmm. but they weren't just getting at those deals. They were levering up their position. So they have a book of, you know, a a billion dollars of the merger deals, but they, they've, they only have a billion dollars of, uh, they only have like a a hundred million dollars of cash in that book. Right. So they're levered so far up and they've done it with swaps and it's just crazy. Anyways, these spreads blow out everywhere. I mean, everywhere. And it was, it happened like that because everybody got a sniff that these guys were going under. And so it wasn't that everybody was selling as much as everybody just backed away and said, we're not offering liquidity. We're going to let there be price discovery. And it was madness. I don't know. Do, do you remember this? Do you, were you? Uh, I was, I was uh, just coming out of high school at this time, but I've studied the, yeah. I've studied the book and, and talked to various people. On well, the, the long, is, yeah, years, the long yeah. short of it is what's, yeah. what's crazy about this is, is this remind this is like, I was thinking about it all last week. I was like, this is exactly what happened. These guys took super crazy, stupid risk, right? Mm-hmm. They yeah. levered way up, you know, they've got this, this collateral that is highly volatile that they're levered against and it, you know, okay. We're not going to get into the mechanics of what happened. Um, you ad nauseum, you can have, Mike Alfred on the show. He knows all about it. Right? So, but <clears throat> so the, this, so just like the spread blew out here and there were major investment banks that were prime brokers that were going to fail. So they go to the New York fed and they said, look, this is, this is so bad that we've got to shore up the markets. We've got to, we've got to rescue, you know, we've got to be rescued or else the, the financial markets are going to melt down. So that was the impetus for the real step in of the Fed put. And I think I wrote about this, but um, so the strange thing is though, and the, the scary thing is there's no Fed put here in, in Bitcoin and in crypto. It, yeah. There is only downside to the point where it gets washed out. Wh- whoever is, whoever is taking too much risk, Sorry, you have you have the consequences. This is why know? I'm here. This is why I'm here. I believe in free and open markets. If right. you make bad decisions, you should lose everything. Exactly. That's it. 100%. There's no, there's no so, creative destruction except for in these markets. Right. And so, you know, if you if you own Bitcoin and you're yeah. watching all this happen, I mean, my thing is I'm just holding it. I mean, I haven't sold anything. I mean, I'm exactly. just holding it. Why? Because exactly. I think that this is going to swallow up whatever's left now you know as as these other uh, as these other so-called protocols these um these securities they collapse well there's obviously less uh market cap to go into bitcoin so even though bitcoin's dominance the dominance is going up you know it, there's only so far it can go and you still have a lot of people who have not been wiped out who have some cash on the side who are buying some other um, you know, some some cryptos? You've got them buying Ethereum or Solana's been all over the place. So they're they're buying those, thinking that well, especially hedge funds, thinking that that has a high beta to mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Bitcoin, and so they know two things: those those coins have high beta to Bitcoin because that's the stable one, that's a stable asset of the whole group. It's the only, of course, it's different in, in every way that we can think and imaginable. But <clears throat> that's the first thing they know. The second thing they know is that Bitcoin typically leads risk assets now. It's been doing it for months and months and months, right? So mm-hmm. as mm-hmm. risk comes out of the market, Bitcoin goes down first. As risk comes back into the market, Bitcoin goes up first. So you're levered both ways, right? So they're levering themselves to a recovery as these mm-hmm. things have gotten beaten down, knowing that you know, if they don't die, which I don't think they'll die in the cycle, you know, I think they're just going to keep going and they'll, they can make some great money that way. So I love how Michael Saylor, <clears throat> I heard him talk about uh, the frequencies of settlement and he's talking about Bitcoin and how high frequency it is relative to everything else in the marketplace, call it equities, bonds or whatever. 
And so when you think of it in, in a mechanical kind of term uh, or mm-hmm. a mechanical kind of way, it makes sense that it should that it should front run the actions of, of everything else. So like if the market has reached max credit expansion and is starting to contract, Bitcoin should lead that. And on Absolutely. the, and on the recovery on the bounce, Bitcoin should lead that. I agree. Yeah. So, I agree. yeah. And so it does, it does make sense. It does make sense. At some point though, it decouples, you know, it does decouple. Uh, I, when, you know, um, it's got to get to a certain market cap. It's got to have enough liquidity that it is it, it's a separate asset class, right? And, and we're nowhere so near that right now. Not even close. Right. Yeah, we're not, not even, even close. close. Not even close. No. No. I mean oh, it's the, yeah. The the reason that we started going down this path is we were talking about the spillover for Japan. Like if this really gets out of control and they have to step in. I mean, you're literally talking about one of the the top five uh central banks on the planet and the currency that that's with it and the debt market that's associated with it potentially i mean i mean i don't know how what the problem yeah yeah, what what is the probabilities we're at here is this really a rare chance or are we really at the end game as far as no i think uh, i think i think it can go a lot i think go for a while you know i'm watching it but i think it can go for a while i mean what 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 are the what's the bank of japan's choices right that, so as it, as this pressure builds, they can either scrap the yield curve control entirely, just walk away. They can move the the uh, the peg from twenty five basis points to maybe fifty basis points. You know, is that the next move? You think they're just going to move the peg up, and then all these people that are that are causing causing <clears throat> these these massive gyrations as of the last week, they just kind of disappear for a little bit. Well, I. I'm not sure, but let, let me say, let sorry. me, yeah, let me walk through yeah. all of them. So then yeah. the, the other thing they could do is they could, they could target a different maturity on the, on the curve, right? They yeah. Go to the, the, mm. the, the five or the seven or um, the five year, the seven year. Sorry. I, I, I try really hard not to talk in, in, in <laughs> financial speak. It's hard because it, it's hard sometimes. Cause I know you understand it, but mm-hmm. I know there's a lot of people who don't know these things that are, that are Bitcoiners that listen to your show that don't know some of these things. So I apologize yeah. if I'm doing that. I'll try to, I, I try to keep it super simple for people, but so they could target a different point on that yield curve, a different bond to control. Okay. Um, or uh, they could, another thing they could do is they could try to save themselves by selling us treasuries. Right. And, um, and showing it, which they've been doing. I don't know how much they've been actively selling versus how much they're just letting treasuries roll off their their balance sheet, but they're definitely they're actively they're 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 definitely allowing their treasury U.S. Treasury balances to decrease, which helps them. They get dollars by yen; it helps them support the yen, right? Um, and then the other thing they can do is they could come to an agreement, which is kind of crazy. This would be a, this would be like global QE, right? Where they come to the U.S. or to another nation, and they say, "All right, you buy our bonds, okay, and we'll we'll buy yours." And it just we just push the QE, you know, down the road on each other's balance sheets. So it's like in your monopoly game, you know, it's the central banker goes to the other central banker and says, "You know, if I uh, we'll buy some I, of those that I'll, equity, yeah. I'll give, yeah, I'll give I'll give you know your." Uh, players 100 bucks each you give my players 100 bucks each and then it's not really qe it's, and, and you're getting you know, so detached from the representative the political representatives they i mean they are along for the ride they are not making any decisions they these central bankers are really kind of they're calling the, shot. the shots as to everything that's happening within these jurisdictions purporting that they're experts in all which I don't think, yeah. and, and nobody knows what's going to happen. Right? Clearly, their health or their their food recommendations are exactly. It's <laughs> they're spot on. So, Jeez. all right, eat your fake meat. So, James, what I think, what I think they're really doing, and this is the scariest part. I think they're playing chicken with the U.S. Fed. Yeah, yeah. I think they're waiting. They're they're watching the U.S. economic numbers closely. We just had a negative GDP print. Right. Mm-hmm. And then we get another one next week. If that comes in negative, 
it signals we are definitely in a recession. We're yeah. heading down that road, you know. Energy prices are up, food prices are up, stagflation, you know. Um, you, you're you're going to have the 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 unemployment rate start ticking up, and then the GDP turns negative. So they're playing chicken and one they're they're trying to hold out to the point where the Fed pauses. And when the Fed pauses, that takes so much pressure off them. Why? We'll go back to what we said at the beginning. The yen follows the spread between the 10-year, the 10-year JGB and the 10-year US Treasury. So if that if that spread stops, then the pressure stops. It's like, okay, okay, we're okay. Everybody okay? We're okay. But again, mm. it just kicks it down the road, right? Yeah. But yeah. I think I think that's what they're doing. And they're hoping that we'll have to reverse course by early next year, which at the at, at the rate we're going. Yeah, it seems know, like that's that's um, that that timeline is like it's gonna happen. I mean, what do you think? That. Does that sound I think does that sound plausible? I think it's gonna happen sooner than that. I think you're and and it's funny because everyone that you hear on CNBC and whoever they're all saying, "Oh yeah, we we're we're maybe just starting to get into the recession. They're going to continue to tighten for, and and they drop this one years with an S on the end of it." And I'm thinking, no. how in the world are you going to do this for for twelve months? Well, they have a goal. They need to get the rates up high enough that then they have room to back off and ease again. So mm-hmm. they need to get them up. Yeah. Preston, they've got to get them up to three and a half, four percent minimum. I mean, they've got to yeah. get them up there and they'll do it fast. That's why we had a 75 basis point. Yeah, they, they've got it's, not because, it's not because they're admitting they were wrong. They're like, oh, dang, we've got to get these up fast because we need these rates to be at a level that we can then back off. Because yeah. what we don't want to do is go negative. I mean, we, we saw what happened and, and Jeremy ran negative rates for so long. It, just this last fall, there was over fifteen trillion dollars yeah. of negative yielding, negative nominal. yielding, not nominal, yeah. not yeah. not real yield. Take out inflation, just nominal. real yield. It's everything. <laughs> it's everything. Everything. <laughs> but yeah, there was there was. So we don't we don't we we want to avoid that, right? So. Hey everybody, Trey Lockerby here from We Study Billionaires, and I wanted to tell you about a new company that I absolutely love, and that is called Trade. Trade combines two of my favorite things, coffee and technology. So what you do is you go to drinktrade.com, there's a super simple survey that you take, and then it tells you which coffee they're going to send you that you are literally guaranteed to love. Meaning, if you don't love it, they'll send you a new bag of coffee for free. And from there, you can keep experimenting so you're not falling into the same rut of drinking the same coffee over and over and over again. There are so many different types of roasters, levels of roast, beans from different parts of the world. There's plenty to nerd out on here. So why not be adventurous and try some new stuff? After I took the quiz, they sent me a bag from Sight Glass Coffee in Northern California, and it's literally my favorite coffee of all time. Normally, I've been drinking a coffee where I have to sweeten it with honey and almond milk, but this coffee, I could actually drink it black. It was so delicious just on its own. And right now, Trade is offering subscribers a total of $30 off your first order plus free shipping when you go to drinktrade.com slash TIP or click the link in the description below. That's more than 40 cups of coffee for free. Get started by taking the quiz at drinktrade.com slash TIP and let Trade find the perfect coffee for you. That's drinktrade.com slash TIP for $30 off. Um, <laughs> I know it's, it's kind of... It's it's mind boggling. Has inflation in the U.S. peaked? Mm. You're well, seeing a, a lot of one. people trying to make that call right now, and I like. I'm just not going to. You know, people have asked me, and I was like, I just don't know. I don't. I don't have anything that signals to me that that that's a very clear answer. Um, well, I, I think I think what we haven't seen is the full effect of energy prices in. Amen to that. Other, in 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 all the in all the things that it affects, right? So energy, oil prices go up, gas prices go up. I mean, every single delivery is is more expensive. Every single item that gets moved from one place to another is more expensive. Every single piece of food that's created is more expensive. That's um, created. You said creating this crap food, right? This garbage food, um, <laughs> but 
uh, every single food piece of food that's processed, it, it's it's more expensive. So I, I mean, again, you would think that we've reached this point that surely prices must come down. You don't, I mean, look, with the, with where the rates are on the mortgage, the 30 year mortgage, and how much pr home prices have appreciated over the last two years, you, you need home prices to come down 50%, 50% to get the same monthly mortgage that you yeah. got on your house back then, just, just two years ago, 50%. So surely, now here's the problem. The CPI is a super lagging indicator, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's, it's hard to tell where even, even if we're starting to see prices come down, you won't, you won't see it in the CPI because that's, you know, that's past data. So it's kind yeah. of garbage data. And the Fed has admitted numerous times, you know, Powell has stood up there and he said, we're, we're reactionary. We're going with what we've got, you know, now you and I have heard Target, Walmart, they've, they're, they've, you know, Target has decreased their earnings estimate by massive amounts because mm -hmm. of the price of shipments, energy, like oh, yeah. it's, it's impacted it's in everything, in everything. It's not, this is not them shipping goods from the target store to the people's houses. This is them getting the goods from distribution facilities to, or overseas from, from China or from India or wherever it's coming from. It's everything. And so uh, I do think the funny thing is I saw in the, uh, in the PMI, right. The manufacturer's index, and the purchasers index, right? In in the PMI, there it, it indicated that the the purchasers were uh, worried about supply chains, but um, their inventory levels went up a lot. Yet they were, from, from what I had heard or saw, right? So their front loading Q three Q four, which is where they have all of their like. Yeah, they're huge percentage of sales over 50% of sales come in the last quarter. Some of these companies, it's 70, 80%, right? Yeah. Christmas, Thanksgiving and Christmas. So the holidays are a massive, massive driver of retail sales. So they front loaded when the, it. When the trend's going up on, on the prices of everything, you're incentivized to stockpile inventory. And, yeah. and you're worried that you can't get inventory heading into that yeah. you know, period. So you front load it. So I think, I think we're going to see, eventually we're going to see a collapse of prices in those places, but here's the problem. Those are goods that we don't necessarily need. Yeah. Yeah. Those are, those are not food. It's mm -hmm. not rent. It's not energy. You know, it's not your utilities. Like every, all those, all those are going up. The rent might come down, but if you have a, if you have a, if you have a, a mortgage rate that is is um, it's not fixed. It's variable. That's gone up. So you're getting hit there. You're getting hit on your gas costs. You're getting hit on your food costs. So you're, you're definitely lowering your, just your discretionary spending. This, so, this goes, this goes back to what we were talking about earlier with, with sailor referring to Bitcoin as high energy money because of the frequency. When we look at food, okay, this is a high frequency good relative to the, the junk that they're selling at, at Target or Walmart that you don't need. This right. is a high frequency, desirable, consumable good that people have to have. So do we not see this, this thing that I just you know slapped a whole bunch of adjectives on? <laughs> um, does, it, does the price of that not contract and come back down and actually become affordable again? Is that, is that what we're up against? Because I, I can only imagine what that supply chain looks like when you're, de when you're delivering a high frequency consumable good. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I'm just looking at like, you know, my wife is, is all about having whole foods in the house and not eating mm -hmm. processed crap. And, um, you know, she's constantly going to the supermarket. She's constantly getting these, these items that will literally die in three days if, if you're not going back to the supermarket and buying more super short shelf life. Yeah. Yeah. Like real food. Yeah. I mean, I, um, 
yeah, I think, I think you're, I think you're right. I, I, I you know, um, same but, goes the fuel, like, right. So like, there's a very high frequency good that, that people have to have, they have to have gas in their car to drive the work. Right. But there's no solution there for, yeah. for a long time. The problem is we, 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 have, we have, um, suffocated the, the, the growth of that industry for so long mm-hmm. with certain narratives and with, um, you know, uh, big the, time, the, the, yeah, there's, there's been no incentive to build there. So infrastructure is kind of a capacity, you know? So, and there's been the fed put, there's been the fed put, right? So like anytime they were going to pack in margin, like right now is a perfect chance, James. Yeah. For them to pack in margin so that they can make capital investments into their infrastructure and their capex. Yeah. But exactly. There's, there's, they're not oh being incentivized God. to. They're being, no. they're yeah, they're 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 who who in their right mind would build into an environment that the politicians are saying, oh, we're gonna have a windfall tax on you guys. We're gonna make sure that your margins aren't too high. We're gonna we're gonna make sure that we regulate how much you're pumping and how much you're refining, when and where and how. Who in their right mind wants to go into that industry right now? Especially after the last call it seven years, they've been shellacked. Shellacked. Pull, they have not had, pull, yeah. pull up their yeah. 10Ks, look at them. Yeah, it's, yeah exactly. It's, not, they've free, been shellacked. not free cash flow and positive. They've been shellacked. Exactly. So it's their, it's their time to actually, you know, solidify their balance sheets and make sure that they're, that they're whole going forward. Yet you've got people that are just career politicians that all they're doing is trying to have the next soundbite to get them to get that margin of vote so they can stay in office so they don't have to go to work. Here's the Fed chair Powell's quote from today during his, uh, you know, conference uh, with or his his discussions with Congress. Raising interest rates will not bring down the major drivers of inflation, namely gas prices and food prices. <laughs> so they admitted it. And they, I mean, they know that they, so what do they do? What do they do? They do the best they can to throw up smoke and mirrors and to adjust that CPI in ways that kind of obfuscate the realities of the prices of the goods that people need and they're hurting them the most, right? How can- how can people not realize that if you provide a, a gas credit by dropping the price, you know, cause this is what they're talking about now. If, if you give a credit of a dollar off on the gas, people will consume more gas than if it was a dollar more, Correct. which drives the price higher because there's less supply in the market. How and that, how in the demand. world, Correct. Do people know this? I, I think and, they know this. And they have to, and the best part is that they have to print money to do it. That's right. It's just another, it's just another form of QE. I mean, this is like a, well, yeah. Or, you know, UBI uh, or UBI. Yeah, yeah, yeah UBI. exactly. It's a, it's a form of UBI. So yeah. I just, yeah, it's crazy, it, but you know, look, when this all started happening back in the beginning of the pandemic, I have a lot of friends who are not in finance and who, you know, um, when I started talking about how the, the money printing is really actually hurting the little guy, how it's not, you know, mm-hmm. yeah. the, the, the Cantillon effect. And I, and I, and I try to explain that to them. They're like, but they need that money. They need that 1200 bucks. Like, yeah. But it's going to hurt on the back end. Like they're going to, they're going to get hit with inflation. It's going to hurt. And arguments about this. Now it, it's not that they're, not smart. They're smart people. Yeah. They're not thinking about it the way we are. They're not looking at the like, like we're looking at this stuff every day. What do you do the first thing you wake up in the morning? Yeah. Besides, like, yeah. You know, I absolutely huh? look at charts. <laughs> first thing I do is and I don't look at Bitcoin to see, oh, how's my portfolio doing? I look no, at to see no. if, if there was a systematic shock last night. Yeah. Like, did something come out? Because that's the leading risk indicator right now. Yeah. Like what happened last night, you know? So <laughs> that's why we get along. 
<laughs> no, you're right. I just go through like I have like 10 or 15 charts always up in my browser and I'm just yeah. I'm just plowing through each one of them to see what what the deltas were while I was sleeping. Um here's here's an interesting one. BRICS currency basket. And we're talking about uh BRICS. This stands for uh Brazil, Russia, India, China, yeah. and South Africa. Um there's talks of them trying to uh basically stand up their own, I guess you'd call that like a mini SDR um, of their currencies and their currency basket. And, uh, you know, I I recently did this interview with Pablo Fernandez and he, he made this comment because he's from Argentina. And he said, what happens when you really start to get like real inflation, not like 8%, but like double digits, like large double digits. Yeah. He said, People run to a, a stable currency that they can trust. For us, it was the, the dollar. Um, and he says what, what happens is, is because the government's trying to implement all these controls and trying to prevent people from going to the dollar and to use their currency and, and uh, preventing the collapse of the currency, he says what happens is the, the, that local currency gets shoved into the hands of the consumers, but the producers are desiring the the stable and the one that actually exactly. stores their buying power. And so this it appears like this is the play for these BRICS currencies, the Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa against um, the US, the euro, and the yen. What we've seen, I mean, this is it doesn't surprise me at all. Now, whether or not they're successful, I don't know. I mean, I would expect long term. I mean, I've said this before, I expect long-term, not in the next two or three years, but long-term, uh, that you, you, you have a couple of currencies that are the base currencies of the world. Like U.S. loses its sole status mm-hmm. and you have the U.S., uh, Euro kind of collapse into each other and, and some other, um, the yen. Um, and then you've got the, you know, you've got the Russian China. And this is it. This is the BRICS you know, the BRICS currency. Um, but why it shouldn't surprise us after what we saw with, with Russia uh, sanctions and with the, you know, you know, the United States seizing U S treasury assets owned by foreigners. What? I mean, if you're, if you're one of these countries, do you want to be holding U S treasuries? Of course not. That's why they're all selling that's why the Russia owns none. That's why China has been selling them with abandon, you know, and they all own what we have suddenly realized is actually important. Not just our good word that we're going to full faith backed by the U.S. government. Great. But having oil and gold and food and fertilizer and wheat actually matters. That's and no surprise. They actually have. Just- something to, to, to stabilize the, the currency with. So does this so, battle, so, you know, and it, it's, when I look at them trying to do this, you know, and I'm trying to look at it very objectively, it makes sense to me that they would, that they would want to do that and, and force the network effect over to the, their, their currencies that they know they're controlling and, and they understand whether they're debasing it or not. Um, but does this drive a wedge between I mean, the split in the world between these these energy producers, these fertilizer producers, these things that the world has to have. Um, I've said this, I think, multiple times on the show, but I think it's it's a very apt example of your body has a bunch of mitochondria that produces the ATP that supplies the energy to your body. If if you suddenly lost thirty percent of them um, in your body how in the world do you possibly expect to go perform any type of energy consuming demand on your body? I, I, Michael Saylor likes to use the, uh, the bloodletting example before a fight. If you went and forced the person to, to, uh, you know, bleed out 30% of their blood, how in the world are they going to be able to do what they're doing? And so when I look at our global cooperation that's required and you separate the world into, let's just call it NATO currencies and these BRICS currencies, right? Does this battle, because both have something to offer each other, right? Maybe some a little bit more than others. 
But collectively, both of these parties need each other to to get along. I think I don't see a world where these two these two entities like break off and don't coordinate with each other anymore. I think they yeah, have to coordinate together. I think they do have to. So, um, you know, honestly, if you look at the and I was I was looking at this because I I, I saw that somebody asked that um, question in that thread that you posted today. And if you look at the weighted average of the five year sovereign uh, CDS is the credit default swaps. So yeah. for your listeners, a credit default swap just is a uh, it's an it's an um, insurance instrument that institutional traders use that when they own a bond, they can buy insurance against that bond failing, uh, you know, uh, defaulting. So credit default swap. And so, but the five year um, default swaps on on the on the bricks is at least 20 times wider than the CDS for the SDR currencies. Okay. I mean, Russia is rated at 100% to default. They're absolutely defaulting. It's just a question of when, right? Now, of course, we, ha we have a hand in that, but that's, that's what's happening. So, but I mean, the credit risk will make it hard for people to deal in that currency. So they will absolutely have to back it by hard currency. They'll ha have to back it by gold. And I think that they would back it by Bitcoin. Now, China is a funny one, right? Because they banned Bitcoin mining. Of course, there's still mining going on there, which is odd. Um, although maybe not surprising. And I don't, and it, there's a question about how much Bitcoin the, the Chinese government may own. We, nobody knows. Um, so, but if you had something that's backed by gold energy. and Bitcoin, <laughs> yeah, work. Energy. energy, work, oil. Yeah, I mean, like that's, those are, so they could stand it up. They could, but just like to your point is that China needs the United States. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, um, they don't, they, they certainly don't want us to default. Right. That would be, that would be terrible. And I For, think you can, you can also say that the U S can't go cold Turkey on any of those countries. Of course not. Of course not. Of course not. They can talk. They're talking a big game as politicians. Yeah. You know, yeah. but so, but, but look at what's happening in Europe. You know, I mean, they're, they're allowing, uh, they're allowing countries to buy energy from from Russia and gas because they don't want a problem this this coming fall and winter of citizens freezing to death because they don't have heat. You know, of course they they dug their their own uh, trench there by shutting down the nuclear plants, but you know we've put ourselves in a spot where just like you said we're so interconnected that we were going to yeah. have to come to an agreement. And, and it almost seems like because there's going to be this battle for who's, who's, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Whose basket of currencies are going to win versus the other. And it's this, mm -hmm. the, the political, the political piece, the maneuvering and all of that. Meanwhile, you got Bitcoin who's just chugging out another block. That's completely apolitical. And it almost like seems like because of that, it's going to be the only thing that, that all those parties can ever agree on. It's almost maddening to sit here and watch the system just try as hard as it can to repel it. It's maddening yeah. because you and I know yeah. how it can fix so many problems. So we won't get problems. into that. You've heard, people have heard that ad nauseum, but it's almost, it's unnerving to watch. And like, you're seeing it act like, this leading risk on asset for so long, it's, it, it can be frustrating. I know it's frustrating for people who've been, who, who are saying, well, that narrative's dead. You know, you, uh, there was a, there was a remark on, on one of my Twitter threads about, well, it's no longer, it can no longer, and this is by somebody who's very smart that I respect. Um, it's, it, you can no longer claim that it's a um, CDS on sovereigns. Well, but the answer is it's not going to act like a CDS that trades in the open market. You know, it's going to act like a CDS the moment you need it. Yes. Like the moment you need it. If you're Venezuelan, if you're in Lebanon, you know, if you're in the Ukraine and you need it to get across the border with your net wealth, then you need it. 
And if you don't have it, your currency is, def is deflating against Bitcoin so rapidly that you won't get a chance to get it. So the point is that it, 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 it saves you in spots, but we're seeing this. We're, we've seen it play out in real time a number of times. Yeah. Yet the system is still battling against it, you know? The, clearly the market hasn't viewed it through the optic of this insurance policy like you're describing it uh, yet. Um, why do so many people in traditional finance not understand this? It's a good question. Um, I mean, I can, I can tell you from my experience, Preston, I, I back in 2018, uh, I had some discretionary, cap, discretionary capital. Uh, I wanted to put to work in something a little bit further out in the risk curve. And, you know, something I hadn't really dug into yet that, cause I had private equity, you know, obviously on real estate house, um, public equity, uh, you know, and I venture capital, like I want to go a little bit out on the risk curve and do something different. So I had heard about this Bitcoin thing and run up to 20 something thousand, come all the way back down to four or five. And so I did what you do as an institutional investor. I went and asked my traditional technology analysts at the investment banks, hey, what about this Bitcoin thing? And I mean, with to the T, every single one of them said, it's, it's, it's super speculative. It's just, or it's a scam or it's a Ponzi. There's no fundamental value to it. Don't just avoid it at all costs. And of course, made the worst trade of my career, which was avoiding it and not mm. buying it mm. and walked away. Okay. So you have some of that that's been going on all these years. Now it's front and center. Okay. It gets a lot of negative press. We, we see it all the time. You guys are out there trying to battle against it constantly. But the, the problem is institutional investors are, they're, they're super closed minded because number one, the system's worked for them perfectly. Yeah. I mean, it's been fantastic for most of these guys. They've crushed Especially it. fixed income. Crushed. Yeah. <laughs> crushed. Yeah. Not this last year, but yeah, the last, the last yeah. 10, 15 years have been 40 years. Yeah. Yeah. And then beyond. Yeah. So, but they, they don't, they don't need it. Okay. So that's number one. They just don't need it. And so their instinct is, Hey, they know that it's, it's, it's disruptive. And so when you hear of disruptive technology and you're in the technology, that's going to be disruptive. <laughs> yeah. Of course, you're going to battle against it. It's your first instinct. You're going to battle against it, yeah. whether yeah. or not, you know, anything about it, but let's just pretend. Okay. Because I do know that there are institutional investors that the, the ones who know it, who are playing it right now, press and our hedge fund guys, mm -hmm. the institutional, the true institutions, the ones who, who, who control the massive amounts of capital, right? The, the ones who have that control the hundreds of trillions of dollars in investment assets. These guys are your pension funds, your endowments, your nonprofits. You know, these are sovereigns. They, these are, these are players that are so big that they, these are the ones who really move the market. Okay. Mm -hmm. But why have they not done it yet? Well, the problem is it's structurally very difficult to do. Mm -hmm. Number one, when you're at a pension fund or endowment or something, you've got, you've got mandates of what you can do. Okay. Let's say, let's talk about a pension fund. You've got a mandate of in your fund of what you can buy. And it's very, it's tight. You can't just buy. If you're, if you're in a growth stock uh, fund, part of that pension fund and you're the portfolio manager of that of that uh portfolio you've got a really tight narrow narrow mandate right so but let's pretend that a portfolio manager digs in reads a bitcoin standard okay reads the price of tomorrow jeff booth's awesome book understands the deflationary versus inflationary pressures that are about to collide that are actually colliding right and uh, they, they, they see it, they get it, they understand it, and they see it as a separate asset class and something that is insurance and, and is more like a bond than they've admitted that it should be something they own in their portfolio, even just 1%. Mm -hmm. 
just yeah. 1% of their portfolio, okay? So let's say they get there, they get to the understanding. Well, the first thing they've got to do is get their chief investment officer to buy into it. So they've got to orange pill that guy, okay? Then they've got to get, if, they, if they're successful there, then they've got to get the investment committee to agree to it in order to adjust their mandate, okay? So they've got to say, you want to say something? No, I was just going to say, so this is like point one raised to like the, the ninth power. Yeah, like the, the exactly. Math, the math. The math, the math is exactly. <laughs> so then they get all those guys. So now we're talking about weeks or months of meetings just to get the, those people, the investment people, the, the risk takers, okay, on board. Now you've got to get the risk mitigators on board who are the general counsel and the compliance officer the chief compliance officer and the compliance committee. So you get the general counsel, the, the chief compliance officer, you've got the com compliance committee. Now you want to talk about meetings. Holy mother, like you cannot believe what this is like. Okay. So then they go through all those meetings. Okay. They finally get everybody understanding it on board. They're all gone on and done their homework and they, and they, they're on board. They at least get to majority where they can start pushing this through. Well, then they've got to get everything in place. Like who's going to trade it? Is, is, the exchange, is the exchange worthy enough to handle the capital of this pension fund? And is it going to breach any fiduciary duty of this pension fund by using them? That's number one. Then how are they gonna settle it? Like who's, 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 going, to, who's gonna be their prime broker? Like pension funds don't hold stock certificates in their back or office. Yeah. They have a broker who, hold, who holds everything for them, custodian bank, holds everything for them. So who's going to custody it? And who's got the keys? Are they going to do multi-sig? Like who's going to be in control of those, sig the, those, uh, those signing devices? Like how is that going to work? And then you get all that done and you still got to figure out when you're going to market. Like do you market at midnight London? Do you market at the closed in New York Stock Exchange? Like because it's open 24 seven. So there's just a litany of, of steps you have to yeah. go through. And so, so for the first time, so... This is the great thing though, Preston. And it's unfortunate that the, that the price has collapsed here, but I think it's given people a lot of opportunity here. And this is- Big why. opportunities, yeah. So you were around um, in high school. You got, you, maybe you were, you were in investment club and you played the uh, dot-com bubble a little bit, right? So, and you, and you saw how some of these prices, they got released, IPO'd and just went yeah. tenfold the yeah. first day, okay? So- I was sitting on a hedge fund desk at the time and, you know, you would go in. The, so what happens in, in, in IPO allocation, you know this, but for the benefit of your listeners, what happens in an IPO allocation as an investment banker or, or as, a, uh, as a hedge fund or uh, an investment uh, firm, you ask to be allocated a certain amount of that IPO. You say, we want 100,000 shares. We love this Google thing. We want to own some of it, right? And so the investment bank works with their, their syndicate desk and they decide who gets what. And it, back then it was like, well, who knew who? What kind of favors did you need? How, much, how many commissions did they give us as an investment bank? Have they done a lot of business with it? You know, like it was, it was ridiculous. Mm -hmm. But you'd go in for 100,000 shares and you're this huge hedge fund and you get one, two, three, four, 5,000 shares. That's it. So a thousand shares of this IPO, but Preston, this thing will go up, you know, a hundred, mm. 200, $300. You'd make a quarter million dollars without, you know, without even blinking, you know? Yeah. yeah. And so um, there's a point to this. So for the first time you're sitting in the same seat as those hedge funds, if you're an yeah. individual investor, because you don't have to go through all the garbage that the institutions have to go through yep. to, to buy Bitcoin. You can buy it right now. You know, you don't have to go through all that. Isn't that crazy? It's just crazy to me that retail actually has the, the, has the, the edge, advantage they have the, here. They have the advantage and they have the edge. And it just, I mean, it's, it's like, and when watching, they come in, when they do come in and they've oh, got, it's going to be you know, crazy. But because they don't, they're going to say, I need 1%. They're not going yeah. to say, oh, well, it's trading at $47,000. Wait until it comes back to 42. No, they're going to say, I need 1%. Go yeah. buy 1%. 1 of my portfolio. Sorry. Yeah. I need 1% of, of my portfolio. I've got, I'm, I'm managing 
you know, a hundred million dollars, I need, you know, a million dollars or a billion dollars need $10 million worth. And if you're Apple, if you're Apple, their balance sheet is, what what is their balance sheet now? It's gigantic. 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 Yeah. So people's heads spin. They make people heads. So, and they're just, and that's just one, one company, one pension fund. Yeah. Yeah. And when these guys come in, so I actually wrote this down somewhere here, Preston, there's five, there's five asset managers who control $30 trillion of assets. Okay. BlackRock, Vanguard, Fidelity, State Street, and Morgan Stanley. $30 $30 trillion. When all those guys come in and they get one or 2%, they're not going to get 1% and tell the world. They're going to get 3%, 5% and tell the world. <laughs> and then everybody's going to be going. I mean, that's just Insane. the way I see it happening. And so. people got to realize that if they buy a trillion, you know, if, if, if a trillion comes into this market, it doesn't move the market cap by a trillion. There's a friction. There's lot friction. more than that. It's called trading friction. They've got to yeah. find the price that that people are willing to sell. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, there was another topic I wanted to, to hit with you here, and I know we've we've covered a lot of uh, space here, and I, I'm looking at the time. Um, I want to talk about the real estate market with you because, yeah. uh, my lord, this just looks like a total disaster. Yeah, you. it's it's incoming. Disaster incoming, right? Now, I don't think it's going to be... You think it's worse than 08? No, because because I don't. Because people aren't levered the way they were in 08. I mean, Mm -hmm. you remember you were back in 08, there wasn't Uber, but you you, you were taking a cab in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. Somebody was, you know, the cab driver was like, oh yeah, I own six houses, you know? Yeah. Wow. Well, and the values have appreciated so much in nominal terms just in the past year alone that that puts people way further in the green yeah. Uh, so here's the yeah. problem. Yeah, exactly. Well, you just hit on it. That's going to be the problem, right? Because, yeah. because okay, it, housing prices have to fall 50%. I think we talked about this earlier on the show. They have to fall mm-hmm. 50% to have the same to have, have the same mortgage payment as you did two years ago. Because houses price, house prices went up so much yeah. and so did interest rates, right? Interest rates have doubled and so have housing prices. So they, they have to come down 50% just to have the same, right? But the problem is, they're coming down, demand's coming, the demand's coming off. It's just falling out of bed, right? There's no demand right now in so many cities, right? So the problem is as those prices come down, people's equity that they are expecting to be sitting on as part of their personal balance sheet is evaporating. They may have borrowed off of it because they've Mm -hmm. got lines of credit. You know, they've got home equity lines of credit that they're borrowing off of that are now upside down mm. because you know they they took on an extra 100 grand at the wrong time or whatever it is and so that's going to start squeezing people's credit so now you're watching the credit the people's credit card debt tick up back up to the 2008 levels mm-hmm. right mm-hmm. and so here we are again i don't think it's going to be as bad in the housing market as it was back then because I mean, look who's buying up all these houses, BlackRock mm-hmm. and Berkshire Hathaway. Well, all they're going to do is rent them out, right? And they can sit mm-hmm. them forever, right? Mm-hmm. So I think, it's, I think it's just a different structural problem, but it is a big enough problem that, again, it's going to cause more stagflation where you've got inflation of goods that people need, but a deflation of, of their assets at, at a time when, you know, um, the Fed is raising rates. It's just, it's a recipe for more pain. Yeah. Period. What are your thoughts on it? I'd be interested to know. Yeah, no, I think the, I think the thing that is at least a little bit of the saving grace is I think you got a lot of people that, uh, you know, if they had 20% down or 30% down already paid into the house and the house doubles in value because uh, housing prices are going bananas everywhere. um, That's going to help ease the burden a little bit. Now, my concern is for people that are new home buyers or have to move because of work or whatever, and they're just not going to be able to buy as much house uh, for the price that they can afford um, coming out of yep. it. So that's it, it's, it's a noose that once you drive those rates, especially you do it 
uh, systematically over a 40 year period of time that as you, as you continue to tighten those yields down to nothing and you get everybody locked in with, with not much down on the house, they're there. Like they're yeah. going to have to, they're going to have to stay there because as, as rates rise and based on the, the inflationary environment that I kind of expect in the coming decade, I just don't know that. Um, yeah. All the people are moving from, okay. From San Francisco to Austin. Austin's yeah. not cheap. That is not yeah. a cheap city. Yeah. Right. So now you're, you're, you have, of course there's, you can get a whole lot more house in Austin than you can in um, San Francisco. But mm-hmm. like you just said, it, it precludes them from going and taking a mortgage at six, 7% now mm-hmm, mm-hmm. on, on a house that they is now going to be comparable to the one they're leaving. Mm-hmm. So what's the point? Yeah. So yeah, it does, it restricts movement. Yeah. It's interesting. I think it, it, it's a next, it is, it's something that hasn't been talked about much, but um, you're starting to hear people chirp about it and i think I, I you can sense it's just another thing we need a, we need a few more data points there i want to see a few more yeah. data points to see where this thing's going and how it's really affecting people's bottom line and where and where the consumer credit is going how much mm-hmm. it, it may mm-hmm. be affecting that so people that have locked in very low interest rates and they don't plan on moving um, I mean, they're going to be huge beneficiaries of it if they can continue to hold down a job and, and make their payments. Um, because the, as you're you deflating, well know, you're, you're, dude, you're deflating away your debt. Yeah, exactly. So I was, yeah, I mean, I was at, at the bank the other day cause I had to send a wire. So I had to sit down with a banker and fill out like 17 pages of paperwork. <laughs> I've said I've literally sent 250 wires with this bank, but I can do it every time. <laughs> so I go and fill out all the paperwork. And uh, this young banker, you know, he's a kid, but he's like, "Well, what do you what do you suggest I invest in?" Whether because he asked me what I do, and you know, and uh, and I was talking to him about, it and he's like, "Well, first I want to pay down my mortgage." I was like, "I go, what? Back up the train." <laughs> What? Why? He's like, oh, it's just I just feel like I should own it. I shouldn't have that debt. Should I was like, yeah. you understand as as the dollar inflates that you're paying off your house with cheaper dollars. Yeah. He's like, I never really thought about that. This is a this is a, a banker, you know. The, the Dave never Ramsey, really that the Dave Ramsey, uh, pay it back as fast as possible and all that stuff. I think it's. I think it, I don't want to bash Dave for trying to get people to yeah. get their finances under control, but in this Super particular, yeah. Yeah, yeah, in this particular scenario, like this, I is, think I, I wouldn't agree with that. That's all. Yeah, yeah, I wouldn't agree with it. Yeah, yeah. get your get your credit card debt off. Yeah, pay exactly. that down. Make sure you have no credit card debt, especially now because that is yeah. ballooning. So. Yeah, that did you see that chart? Over twenty percent, I guess, is the national average on it. It's insane. Wow. APR. Ow. It's insane. Yeah, I didn't see that chart. Yeah, it makes sense. So, James, we got to do this more often. I thoroughly enjoyed the chat with Likewise, you. Likewise, man. And uh, I'm sure there's going to be, I can only imagine what the coming quarter is going to bring. Holy moly. God, oh God only knows. <laughs> Hang on tight. I don't profess to know, you know? <laughs> but now I know. I mean, just, well, you, can... you know, I just look like, I'm just looking around for where I, where you may see the risk. Where's the systematic risk? Yeah. So, and you do the same thing. So I like talking yeah. to you, man. Yeah. So. We'll see where it goes, but uh, we'll we'll definitely uh, do something here in the future. And boy, thank you so much for coming on the show. Is there anything you want to highlight? I know you you work with different organizations, or you want to yeah. Maybe on Twitter. Well, you you just had you just had us on, uh, with, you know, um, with our Looking Glass Education platform. You can find it on my Twitter profile in my in my bio, um, and that's and that's the thing that uh, that Greg Foss kind of pulled me into. Uh, Seb Bunny, Daz Bia, you've got Pleb Music on there, Dahlia Platt, uh, Jason Sansoni is a surgeon in, in um, uh, Wisconsin. These guys are super smart, guys and gals. They're so smart. I just, I, I basically, I'm, I'm the old, you know, the old guy with Greg. Uh, we just help um, with a little bit of, of advisory. Uh, but, um, Greg's, uh, he, he helped them really kickstart it. So he's, he's been mm-hmm. a very important part. I don't want to be little that, but da- but the, the guys that, that are running it, um, they're awesome. And so this is just a simple platform. 
an educational platform for your listeners. If you want to know more about money, how money works, the system, and how it all kind of leads to Bitcoin, it's not Bitcoin heavy. It's really money mm-hmm. heavy and, you know, um, and the history and, and how, and it's super simple and it's in easy modules to go through, just like a, a coursework online. I highly recommend it. That's the, mm-hmm. that's the one thing. And then part of that is my informationist newsletter. Mm-hmm. So I write a newsletter every Sunday um, comes out that I take one complicated financial topic and simplify it. Super, mm-hmm. super simple for anybody to understand. Mm-hmm. Um, and I love doing that. I think it, I hate the fact that, that my industry is so opaque. And I hate the fact that people are scared of it. They don't, they don't know what to do. They don't know how to, they hear all this jargon and they don't know what it means. And it just goes right past them and it shouldn't. So mm-hmm. that's, it's a great thing for people and it's free. It, I just, I just really like doing it. It's like one page, boom, knockout. Like what's a yield curve control or yeah. you know, what's a fed put or so I do that and that's it. James Lavish on Twitter. You know where I am. James, thanks so much for making time. And I really enjoyed the chat. Thank you. Honored to be on here. And I look forward to the next time pressing. See you. Absolutely. See you. Thanks for watching. Make sure to subscribe and hit that notification bell so you don't miss out on the next podcast episode and new investing resources. What are your takeaways and thoughts on this discussion? Let us know in the comments section below. 